So we're going to look today at World War II's home front, what's happening 1942 to 1945 in terms of the domestic economy, but also in terms of groups that are seriously, and in some cases, um, remarkably, either for positive or negative, affected by the war. Then we're going to look at those implications on how World War II really impacted the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. We're not going to look at it in terms of the Cold War, but we're going to look at it in terms of how it changed economics, how it changed social lives. So we start with Herbert Hoover, which is an obviously odd place to start. He has nothing to do with World War II as far as we know, except for the fact that we look at his legacy from World War I, the Food Administration. Remember, we had our wheatless days and our meatless days, and then the department, you know, other departments had their um, heatless days, but it was all really voluntary. And despite the fact that there was something called the WIB, the War Industries Board, the government wasn't really that involved in the economy. Now, certainly they were involved in restricting civil liberties. We saw that. Charles Shank can attest to that. But we want to focus on how World War II was quite different in this regard. So there actually was something called OPA or OPA, the Office of I uh, Price Administration, which is really concerned with making sure that prices didn't get too high. So what they effectively did is they put price ceilings on everything that was sold. The whole reason was is that they were worried that you know as a result of scarcity, prices would go up and it would really you know injure. Uh, Americans uh, in the time of war. So if you look here, we see, you know, sort of an ad out there, rationing means a fair share for all of us. So you could only get so much um, of something. And if you went sort of beyond your rations, as they had in the ration books, you could actually be in trouble. So on the right, you see refuse to pay more. So, you know, don't go into a car dealership and say, oh, I really, really want this and pay more because that will throw off the entire equilibrium of the system. So there was a real focus on everybody, you know, doing their part by playing their role and not being greedy. And in fact, the government was controlling that this time. So what we want to look at here is just an example of like, if you look at the top, you got the OPA. So you could only sell food for a certain price. And I don't know when you're going to be watching this, but it's always interesting when I would show it, you know, sixth and seventh period or years before seventh and eighth period to see like what actually looked appetizing on here. Frankly, uh, not much, but I think you will find that they have an American cheese sandwich. If that's somewhere on here, American cheese sandwich, 10 cents, believe it or not, American cheese really was developed during World War II. Uh, as a way to use um, less dairy. <laughs> and uh, again, if you're eating American cheese, certainly, hopefully, you know, it is a dairy product, but it's certainly not cheese. Doesn't mean I like it uh, any less. Now, whereas there was the WIB, which couldn't do all that much during World War I, the War Production Board was very, very strong and essentially said, you're going to be making wartime goods. So, you know, civilian companies, private companies, the government is going to tell you what to do. So again, the allocation of scarce materials, they're going to go to the wartime industry, prohibiting non-essential production. Interesting that we hear about sort of essential versus non-essential in terms of what we're going through right now. But the whole idea was, is we're going to gear our economy to winning this war, not just in terms of supporting Again, our own effort, but supporting those of our allies. And if you go all the way back, you know, to cash and carry all the way through lend lease, we had been doing that for a few years up until this point. So there was a heavy emphasis again on, you know, you don't act greedy. So if you ride alone, again, you're burning up fossil fuels, you're burning up rubbers uh, that can be used again in your tires. Um, you know, you're riding with Hitler. You would actually take your, you know, waste from anything that you'd cooked uh, meat and you'd actually take it to your local meat dealer to be reused and sort of recycled in the war effort. So again, it was like World War I in terms of self-sacrifice, but this time they were actually, there were more controls on it. So again, here we see Dr. Seuss, similar idea. The more you quote unquote joy ride, the more you go out and just drive for driving sake, um, then you're actually helping, you know, the people that were fighting against the Axis powers. I'm going to skip this real fast. 
you have this whole idea. And in fact, we've actually seen it here. Donald Trump actually signed an executive order saying you couldn't hoard uh, medical materials during this time. But this whole idea that Mrs. Hoarder is out of order, that people that didn't think about others and just sort of, you know, bought beyond their means or just bought be because they could, that it was really un-American. Now, I want to sort of take that idea of what happened in the 40s where people were being told, don't spend, don't spend, don't spend, don't spend. And then all of a sudden, you know, come 1945, you're going to see um, not only an explosion in terms of the baby boom, but you're going to see really like the 1920s all over again in terms of the economy. So the 1920s is to the 1950s, which is actually to the 1980s in terms of this like consumer mania. So one of those places that we tend to see it is actually in terms of the suburbs. So we actually saw people moving to the suburbs as cars became more popular in the 1920s. And we're going to see it again in the 1950s. This is a famous Life magazine ad. And um, we have later known that this was basically staged. They did not just drive into some suburb and find that every single house had a moving van bringing all their stuff in. And again, they were moving from the city. It was this suburban migration. Uh, any of you who took human geo certainly um, know about this, but tended to be white families, and in many cases, white veterans of World War II that were moving out to the suburbs. They were going to have you know a small house, their own plot of land, and this was going to be the American dream. Now, it's important to understand that there was actually a company that sort of, you know, took this almost like assembly line approach and William Levitt created essentially these, you know, carbon copy uh, of each other, these 150 houses per week, same house, identical interiors and only slightly, you know, varied facades, very, very cheap. So you could buy them for about $8,000. My own uh, grandparents, they didn't live in a Levitt town. They were on the West Coast, but they bought a home very cheap uh, as my grandpa had been a veteran of the war. So they bought there in 1948. There was just an explosion of suburbs around the country. Now, it's interesting. If you look, almost every house is exactly the same. Um, tended to be two bedrooms, tended to be just one bath. They did not have any basements because they literally just sort of built them on slab. If you're going to, you know, didn't want to go ahead and have to dig down, they were doing it very, very quickly. So certainly we're going to see in some ways the end of American cities in some regard at this time, but you're also going to see the huge growth of the American suburbs. Now, I want you to understand that there's a reaction to this, you know, hyper consumerism, this moving to the suburbs to chase the American dream, because just as we saw the lost generation writing from France, just how hollow the 1920s were after, you know, all of the death of World War One, you had a group um, really started on the East Coast, but really emerged on the West Coast called the Beat Generation. In many ways, they are the lost generation 2.0. These were writers, these are poets, these are artists who, again, are claiming, what are you guys doing? Have you not sort of forgotten, you know, what we went through? At the same time, the Cold War is going on and they're seeing everything ramping up again. Jack Kerouac wrote the book On the Road, which in many ways sort of stands as the Bible of the Beat Generation. It's also uh, a book that I did my junior year term paper on way back in 1994, if anyone cares. But the Beats oftentimes are thought to be sort of the proto-hippies. There was a real emphasis on psychedelic drugs, um, you know, just sort of sexual experimentation, um, sort of more communal living, rejection of the sort of 1950s, you know, leave it to beaver, um, father, mother, two kids, white picket fence. And so it's an interesting sort of transition between the 1950s and the 1960s. Now, we want to look actually at groups that were affected in World War II and by World War II and sort of what those ramifications are. There's actually a group that I left off of here, and that, of course, is Native Americans. And I will get to that in this discussion. So certainly we've seen on the left and we saw with Emory for you know the many months that we were in class, the We Can Do It poster. And of course, oh, hi, Andy and oh, hi, Jasmine right next to it. But We Can Do It was Rosie the Riveter. This is, of course, the iconic 
propaganda to show, you know, when men are gone, women will make the difference. We certainly saw that in World War One, but we're going to see it um, in a much more acute way in World War Two. On the right, you sort of have a picture of the, a, a real life Rosie. In fact, there was no person named Rosie, but they certainly used the archetype of the quote, the woman left behind to do the work. So what we want to pay attention to is that about 25% of married women worked outside the home and women were doing much heavier industrial work than they'd actually done in World War I. Okay. But most people that were involved in sort of wartime work were not involved actually in the factories, but more in service sector jobs, what we would call government girls. I know it sounds really pejorative, but that's what it was called at the time. It's important to recognize that at the end of the war, despite all their efforts, you know, many women went back to the home in part because there was a concern that men needed jobs. Okay. So we actually have the same phenomenon happening World War II as World War I. We don't really have this sort of flapper of the 1950s, even if we think of sort of, you know, the, the poodle skirt and everything. That's not like a, a true rejection of, you know, the norms that we had seen. What we also want to pay attention to is that more women are going to serve. And so we see them serving what are called auxiliary corps, the wax, the waves, the spars, the wasps. They're not going to fight in battle. Okay. There are women that are actually killed in action. That means they're sort of near the front lines helping out, but they are not able to actually fight in battle. And in fact, it hasn't been until the last decade that women were actually allowed to fight. Okay, but it is important that women were in Europe playing an important auxiliary role in every one of the branches. Now, it's important for us to realize that when women came home, you know, both out of the factory and sort of out of the auxiliary corps, there was sort of a race to the suburbs, as I talked about earlier. And there was this real emphasis on being sort of the perfect housewife. And you can see, you know, how to do it, a how to book, you know, cooking and cleaning and taking care of the kids while the man was off working. So we see, you know, again, life in the suburbs, very much sort of romantically portrayed. But what we also want to focus on is that there's going to be a backlash to that. So in many ways, you know, in some ways, the flappers sort of are the rejection of what's going on um, in terms of gender stereotypes and gender traditions. Well, what you have here was, you know, in the 1950s, this embrace in some ways of the cult of domesticity again. But then people are going to look around, particularly older women, and are going to say, wait, 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 wait. We need to think about feminism in a new way. So we have what's called the second wave of feminism. And again, it's made up of many middle class and in some cases, upper middle class. It's also caused by, and some would even argue that the early parts cause a sexual revolution and then it builds on that. So we certainly can look back to 1848 and Seneca Falls all the way through, you know, the 19th Amendment and sort of see this again as a new wave. And the book that really starts this is The Feminine Mystique. So we actually, if we're thinking about, you know, novels by great female authors, we have Uncle Tom's Cabin. We have Helen Hunt Jackson who wrote A Century of Dishonor about Native Americans. And then we find ourselves with Betty Friedan. And she's actually portrayed in that uh, new FX show that's coming out, I think, like next week or the week after called Miss America, uh, which is, or sorry, Mrs. America, which is going to be about uh, Phyllis Schlafly trying to knock down the ERA. But the book, The Feminine Mystique, is interesting because it's written by Friedan and she had gone to Smith College. So you have to remember that back in the day, there were the Ivy League for men, and then there was sort of their sister schools. And, you know, many brilliant women went to Smith College when they couldn't go to the Ivy League. And so for her 15th year anniversary uh, reunion, she sort of checked out what everyone was doing. She's like, you know what? These women are unhappy. You know, if you think these women are in their late 30s, she happened to be, you know, slightly older. Um, but she writes this book and she says, you know what? Five word phrase, very important. There's a problem without a name. And what she was saying was there's this ennui, there's this stifling. We're, we're really well educated. What are we doing with our lives? We've been relegated to second fiddle and we don't like it. So this book becomes a major bestseller and really is considered to be sort of the beginning of this new 
uh, women's rights movement. Now, soon thereafter, or actually in between when Friedan was doing the research and actually wrote the book, you've got the pill. And this is going to be the first oral contraceptive that women can use. So we can obviously go back to Margaret Sanger and her work in the 1920s in birth control, but the pill becomes incredibly popular. So if you look just between 1961 and 1965, from 400,000 to 4 million, and it really is considered to be quite liberating for women. Now, there are conservative critics, you know, the 1960s is not thought to be a particularly conservative time, but there are conservative critics who are like, look, if you allow women to not have to worry about the repercussions of having sex, then it's going to undermine sort of the moral fabric of the country. Now, of course, we also talked way back about how allowing women to vote was going to undermine, you know, the fabric of the country as well. So again, th that was a criticism. But Friedan starts the National Organization for Women, which is still around today. And it was thought in many ways to be sort of like the women's equivalent of the NAACP, which was started back by W.E.B. Du Bois in the early 1900s. It's going to play a major role in the African-American civil rights movement. So her goal was to bring about equality for all women. Now, interestingly, they didn't tend to always look out for poorer women or women of color. That's important to recognize. And that's been a real Achilles heel uh, and criticism of almost all, uh, you know, women's rights movements, uh, pretty much up until recent times, and they were looking to end discrimination and her, her, you know, sexual harassment. Even though that sexual harassment term hadn't really become in vogue yet, they wanted to work, you know, help reproductive rights. Again, abortion is illegal in many states at the time. They're looking to end violence against women. They talk a bit about homophobia. Uh, but the gay rights movement hasn't fully sort of taken off yet. And so what we look at here is sort of the, whereas Gloria Steinem is sort of this um, more of the public face of the organization, while Betty Friedan was, was a bit older, Gloria Steinem starts Ms. Magazine, which if there's the book, The Feminine Mystique, that really is the start, Ms. Magazine becomes really sort of the, the more sort of um, – hip and sort of in the mainstream um, voice for women. And it makes history when it publishes the names of women who've actually had abortions. And again, this is 1972. Roe versus Wade is not until 1973. And then it has a cover story on abuse against women. It's really sort of pushing the envelope to trying to take these issues out from behind closed doors out into the open. And it even goes so far, again, as to say, you know, should there be uh, a female president? And sort of putting out there this whole idea that, you know, in 1972, would it take a Wonder Woman to uh, really, you know, help the country. And if you look, you've got Vietnam going off, you know, on the right and saying, you know, oh, this is a woman's job. Now, obviously today we still have not yet had a female president. The same year that you had that magazine come out, cover come out, you had the 1972 uh, Title IX. And what we know most about Title IX is it's really sort of created both educational opportunities for women as well as athletic opportunities at the high school and collegiate level. And then, of course, we want to go back to what we saw with Alice Paul with the Equal Rights Amendment, which was proposed way back in the early 1920s. But then they're going to sort of find a way to try to bring it back. So again, it didn't get passed, but it didn't get rejected back then. So about 50 years after it was originally introduced, it actually goes out to the states and it needs to get 38. It needs to get three fourths of uh, the states. And it looks like it's going to go. It looks like it's going to go. And I think I've, I've mentioned this in class. And then Jimmy Carter even extends it, but it doesn't win the 38 that it needs. And, and much of it has to do with Phyllis Schlafly, again, who the show is going to be about on FX. Stop ERA, stop taking our privileges. And her Eagle Forum really argued that if you make sort of men and women equal under the law, that's going to take the difference away between men and women. And women are going to go off to fight at war and, and women are going to have to use men's bathrooms or everyone's going to, have to use the same bathrooms and women are going to lose their dependent wife benefits under Social Security. So interestingly, again, you know, a white upper middle class woman was the one who actually stopped the ERA. Now, 
truly sort of the watershed moment in this second wave of feminism is Roe versus Wade. And I know you guys have probably heard about it. It is, again, probably the most divisive and polarizing of the Supreme Court decisions of the last 50 years. And in 1973, the Supreme Court argued that as a result of a woman's right to privacy, that the government could not allow states to prohibit abortions. So in the first trimester, which is, again, just a little more than three months, women are allowed to get abortions and states may not prohibit it. Now, since 1973, states have found ways to sort of try to limit it. um, And in some cases, that's worked. And certainly in some states right now, they're actually doing what are called heartbeat laws that say that if a baby has a heartbeat, it could not... uh, you can have an abortion. Uh, that's only about six weeks. Again, um, that goes directly against Roe versus Wade. Um, but states are hoping to get this into, you know, sort of the legal channel so that it will appear in front of the Supreme Court, which is now, again, uh, a conservative majority. And many people uh, in the United States that are conservative are hoping to overturn Roe versus Wade right now. Now we're going to shift back into World War II. I know I took us pretty far along. Um, from you know Rosie the Riveter all the way to Roe versus Wade. But if you're going to look here, you have African-Americans. So it says Negro job hunters enter here and then having to really wind their way to war industries. And the argument that Seuss is making here is that you have African-Americans that want to work during the war, just as we certainly saw with the Great Migration in World War One, the Great Migration actually has continued all the way from 1916 up through World War II, and the argument is that it's just way too hard. There was actually a proposal back, and I don't know if I have the right slide, but there's actually a proposal to have a march on Washington. Again, I know we think of it in terms of Dr. King's 1963 march on Washington, but there was actually the threat from an earlier civil rights leader named A. Philip Randolph that said, you know what? We're going to march on D.C., and we're going to show you know, FDR, that we mean business. Again, Dr. Seuss is making the same argument here, like, okay, so you're playing the piano and you're using the white keys, but why don't you use the black keys as well? There's a group that is willing and wants to work. Why are you ignoring them? Okay, so here we go. So A. Philip Randolph, who actually um, was the president of a union that really had started working on George Pullman's cars, if you remember those luxury cars, the sleeping car porters. And so he said, I'll I'll bring 100,000 people to D.C. And FDR was pretty concerned um, about political embarrassment and violence in some ways similar to what Wilson was embarrassed about when he was going to make the world safer democracy, but women were chaining themselves to the White House fence. Also, there are a concern that D.C. is, 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 you know, pretty Southern at the time and could cause some real problems. So, In the end, FDR does something pretty symbolic. He actually does something where he says, I'm going to investigate discrimination in in war industries. Doesn't really go that far. There is an executive order, but it is considered in some ways the beginning of a recognition by the government that they needed to do things to start uh, looking at discrimination. Now, much as Frederick Douglass, going all the way back in the Civil War, had once said, you know, if you wear upon your breast, you know, sort of, the, you know, the Union crest and you fight in the war, they can never mistreat you again, which was great in theory. And unfortunately, we went, you know, right into, you know, the Black Codes and then obviously Jim Crow. But the argument that you're going to see in something called the Double V campaign is that if you're fighting you're not only just fighting for, you know, the, the ability to take out fascism, but you're also fighting for rights at home. And it's really, really important to understand that African-American veterans of World War II are going to be at the forefront of the civil rights movement. Obviously, MLK, if, you'll, if you know anything about MLK, is way too young to have fought in World War II. But many people that are uh, key voices in the movement come out of this effort where it's like, listen, we fought for our country and we're coming home and we're finding that our rights are denied. And you also have to remember that these were not integrated units that fought in World War II. They're still segregated, although there was some sort of experimental integration and they actually did a poll and they said, you know, hey, if you served with African-Americans, how was it? And most White said, yeah, it actually worked out pretty well. Again, it will not be 
until after the war, where Harry Truman actually integrates the armed forces with an executive order. And then the Korean War will be the first where you actually have that integration. But I'm going to go from World War II and nine years after uh, the end of World War II, in 1954, you truly have perhaps the first sort of great victory in the African-American civil rights movement in the case of Brown versus Board. So what you see right here is you see a picture of Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall was a great leader of the NAACP and then will become the first African-American Supreme Court justice, only one of two right now. Obviously, Clarence Thomas is on the Supreme Court, although he is not the liberal at all that Thurgood Marshall was. Now, it's important to understand that this is the early 50s. And again, you still have separate but equal going all the way back to from Plessy v. Ferguson. And you've got a bunch of different cases around the country. And one of them happens to be in Topeka, Kansas. And the Brown family um, looked at their young daughter, Linda, and said, why does Linda have to go so far to get to a school? And we have a white school right nearby. She's got to take this sort of dangerous route through a train switching yard to get there. And so they're part of a lawsuit. And again, because their name is B, they're at the front of sort of Brown versus Board. Supreme Court hears the argument over a two-year period. There's some complications. Uh, Supreme Court justice leaves. New one comes in. And the ultimate question is, like, what is the impact on African-American children as a result of separate but equal? And what's really interesting is that they use psychological and sociological um, data. Again, this they actually use the social sciences, yay, to recognize that it's not just that you're separate but there's a feeling of inferiority that African-American children can never sort of get over as a result of being in separate but equal schools. And so actually it's a 9-0, very surprising decision that says, you know, all schools have to be integrated. Now, just to put this in context, folks, there are still schools in America today that are segregated. And so the Justice Department is still working on that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We talk about the civil rights movement. So we can also understand that what's happening in Topeka in 54, in 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, we have Rosa Parks, really a pioneer within the civil rights movement, someone who'd been very involved in the movement for a very long time. And so I, I imagine many of you know the story, but the Montgomery bus boycott starts when Rosa Park, Parks refuses to give up her seat. She's not some just random tired woman. This is She is a longtime civil rights activist who, you know, in many ways was was looking for a fight so that they could um, really protest what was going on in the Jim Crow South. And so this bus boycott where African-Americans in Montgomery, Alabama, refused to ride the buses for over a year, ultimately leads to the Supreme Court ruling that segregation on buses is unconstitutional. So whereas Brown versus Board is considered this sort of major victory for you know, for children within the educational environment, getting rid of Plessy v. Ferguson, you're going to see the bus boycott really being sort of the opening move in terms of transportation and public accommodations. And certainly we're going to see on the scene um, Dr. Martin Luther King, who's a young man in his mid-20s, um, who becomes really the leader of what is known as the SCLC, or the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which really takes an active role in leading this bus boycott. So we've seen Thurgood Marshall, uh, with Brown versus Board, we've seen MLK, certainly with the Montgomery Must boycott. And so, pardon me, I'm going to switch right now to uh, Mexicans and Mexican Americans in World War II. And so, due to labor shortages, which we certainly saw, you know, with women filling men's jobs and African Americans to the extent they could after uh, FDR gets involved in what is known as the FEPC, you're going to see the Bracero program. And basically, what it allowed was Mexicans to come to the United States to work in agriculture, particularly in the western and southwestern parts of the United States. And many U.S. employers are very happy to have you know a labor source because so many men have been away fighting in war. And also on the West Coast, to the extent that there are factories, uh, again, we're seeing something that is known as the Sun Belt starting to develop. So there's actually factories in the West Coast as opposed to just the East and the Midwest. And so you're going to have, you know, a heavy um, Mexican-American population within American cities, particularly on the West Coast. But then we're going to also see a backlash. And so just as we saw race riots 
uh, in the 1920s, we're, and we're also going to see them, unfortunately, in the 1960s, we're going to see something called the Zoot Suit Riots in Southern California. So there are a group of uh, Mexican-American men who called themselves Pachucos, and they were in street gangs. And if you look at the on the left, you'll see this, you know, very interesting style um, where, you know, big shoulders, narrow waist, sort of billowy pants, and then this sort of ducktail that they would have in the back. And it's interesting because there was some real criticism of these Mexican-American uh, young men for using so much fabric in a time where, you know, everybody was supposed to be conserving everything. So that was considered sort of unpatriotic. But at the same time, it was also, again, going all the way back to what we saw, you know, leading up to the Boston Massacre, where there were complaints, you know, from the colonists that, you know, the British troops were, you know, taking their women. There was also some complaints, you know, certainly amongst whites that the Mexican-American men were taking their women. And so it, it gets to a point where there's violence that starts and you've got soldiers, actually sailors from down in Long Beach, California, attacking the zoot suitors. Um, you know, ripping their clothes, even cutting off the ducktails, right? In the, you know, their hair, which we certainly seen, you know, recalls, you know, scalping um, of, of Native Americans, you know, cutting off their hair as well, but even, you know, cutting off the hair of Chinese and Chinese Americans. So, of course, as we unfortunately know, uh, we saw this with the Chicago race riots. We saw this in Tulsa as well. And we're going to see this also in race riots with African-Americans. Um, oftentimes, the white police officers do very little to punish the whites and, in fact, seem to help the whites in the process. So we we see, again, the tension that is created by the Bracero program. And we sort of need to you know look in a long view and see about Mexican American rights. So we certainly talked about African American rights. We talked about women's rights. And the name that we really want to focus on is Cesar Chavez, who is going to become a leader of what is known as the National Farm Workers Association, which really becomes known as the UFW, which is still around today. And he used many sort of the tactics of you know, King with civil disobedience that goes, of course, back to people like Gandhi and before that, Henry David Thoreau. And there's a very famous strike where people were encouraged to not buy California grapes. And in the end, it's actually going to help, um, you know, agricultural workers in the West Coast when people don't buy the grapes. So when we look at sort of the, the history of Mexican-American rights, key to understand that in some ways Cesar Chavez is, is really considered sort of the MLK uh, within that um, more West Coast uh, Mexican-American community. Now, here we have a picture of what are known as Navajo code talkers. In case you didn't know, the Navajo language is incredibly hard to learn. Uh, and so not just Navajo, but many Native American um, languages are challenging as well. <clears throat> and in the war, about 500 Navajo code talkers, mostly in what we would call the Pacific theater as the Navy is heading towards ultimately Japan. They're used because, again, no one can decipher this language. And so there are about 25,000 Native Americans that do serve in uh, the U.S. Army or armed forces in World War II. And so if we want to fast forward about 20 years, we're going to see the rise of what is known as AIM or the American Indian Movement. And those of you that saw uh, Thunderheart with me a couple months ago, that's really sort of picking up on that indigenous movement. And again, going all the way back, you know, truly to 1492, or if we're going to look at Anglo Poet Wars or King Philip's you know, War, we want to look at, at tr trying to finally address, you know, much of the mistreatment. And so this goal to have economic independence at the same time honoring Native American culture, protection of legal rights, which have always been under fire. And then again, restoration of lands that they believe have been illegally seized. And, and again, there's sort of a long and sordid history of that. So there's two events that are really important to understand in terms of this um, this move. And, and one is to actually take over Alcatraz, um, again, which had been a federal fort um, and then had become a prison and then was abandoned as a prison. And so all, going all the way back to the second treaty of Fort Laramie, 
they're they're using the argument that says we deserve this land and they actually occupied the land for over a year um it was pretty interesting um unfortunately part of alcatraz was burned down in in the process by some some negligence and they also took over wounded knee and of course you'll remember you know wounded knee 1890 and so there's going to be a shootout between aim members and federal marshals um and they're going to occupy wounded knee for about two months as well so again while you know other civil rights movements are going on you're going to have um again what they're now calling themselves not native americans but american indians all right now lastly we want to focus on what happened to japanese and japanese americans during world war ii and if you look at this dr seuss cartoon this is sort of this you know very nativist anti-japanese assumption that all Japanese from Washington all the way down through California are looking for the signal from their motherland, Japan, to wreak havoc on you know, their new country. And so what you're going to have in early 1942, about two and a half months after a day that will live in infamy, December 7th, 1941, FDR does one of the most famous or infamous executive orders in U.S. history, Executive Order 9066, which effectively says... The military has the power to move anybody of Japanese descent off of the coast. And so you know that we've talked, you know, probably about Japanese internment in middle school. We even referred to it when we were talking about the internment of some Italians and Germans during World War I. But if we look here, we will see that sort of the smaller dots are what they call assembly centers, where people were, were moved to temporarily, oftentimes like horse tracks, literally like um, racetracks and then moved, uh, well to much further inland. If you see the furthest one is actually all the way in Arkansas, if you're looking at this map. So again, Japanese internment is going to occur from 1942 all the way to 1945. Now it's sad. Um, <laughs> obviously it's sad, but it's sad that in Tyndall, there is not a single Asian American mentioned by name. Yes. In Tyndall, there is not a single Asian American mentioned by name, not even Fred Korematsu, who had a famous case against the Supreme Court. Now, Fred Korematsu was a Japanese American man born in America who said, you know what, I'm going to stay in my home. You cannot make me leave with my family. So his family actually went and he stayed home and sort of tried to dodge the law. And at one point he even thought about getting plastic surgery um, so he wouldn't look um, as Japanese as he did. He actually paid the money to the surgeon. The surgeon didn't actually do the work. Um, ultimately, he is um, arrested and he is told that he's breaking the law. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And what is ultimately argued is, you know what? In a time of war, the government has the power to do this because this is a concern about safety. So in some ways, it's sort of like the Shank case that we saw, but it's being used to basically say we can, you know, take a whole group of people and move them away. And, and sadly, when many Japanese and Japanese Americans came back to their homes, they found that their homes had been taken over by white people, their property had been sold. So it is truly a, a, a very, very dark time in U.S. history. Um, it is important to know that the internment camps were, were not the same uh, as, again, you know, work camps or death camps that were going on um, under Hitler. Um, they were pe people were not killed by any stretch of imagination, but people were highly restricted. And so here in 1988, you see President Reagan signing what is known as reparations for Japanese uh, internees. And so every person that was interned uh, got $20,000. It's about $43,000 in today's money. But certainly um, any amount of money is, is not going to take away from something that really um, besmirched um, you know, a part of American history. And in some ways sort of is that analogous piece to taking civil liberties that we saw in World War I. And that, my friends, is the end of a very long lecture. I recognize that. And I appreciate you sitting through it.